Yo, what's up Giants fans, hub watchers, YouTube subscribers, Twitter and Instagram followers. It's your boy No Name back at it again with another Giants vid. And in this one, before I get started, I want to say, I know that you guys know that I'm not one of, you know, I'm not a person to really be too overly optimistic and try to get people's hopes up. Anytime I make any type of prediction, it's usually on the safer side because you got to think of the logistics of things and the probability that goes into it. But with this video, I'll admit, I threw it out just a little bit, not completely, because there is some basis for what I'm about to say. But this is probably one of my more optimistic and a bit more, um, you know, overconfident maybe videos that I have out there. What I'm talking about, of course, if you saw the title already, is that Daniel Jones is going to have a breakout season for the New York Giants. Daniel Jones is going to be one of the top 10 quarterbacks in the league next year for the New York Giants. Daniel Jones may be an MVP candidate. I'm not saying he will be an MVP candidate or even that he will be the MVP, but he may be an MVP candidate. And uh, let, let's let's talk about why. Let's get into why. First and foremost, Daniel Jones, sixth overall pick for the New York Giants in the 2019 draft, came into the league with the most hate that uh, I've really seen any player get. And I can't even say in a long time, just period, the most hate that I've seen any player get. I've never seen anybody uh, just come into the league and get hated on by the media, by the fans, uh, by the fans that are not even on the team that he was drafted by, um, just by everybody all around. The only person that comes to my mind that I know of for sure that didn't hate on Daniel Jones was um, Fisk Vegas. Immediately, he said, give the guy a chance. I, I said, give Daniel Jones a chance, but I had to think about it for a whole day before I came to that conclusion. Um, then there's uh, Q Dog, a good, good supporter of mine. He's in the comments every now and then. He was one of the dudes that said give him a chance. But other than that, we, we're talking ESPN, FS1, NFL Network. You know, the NFL's own scouts, uh, Giants fans, non-Giants fans, NFL fans, non-NFL fans that just look at the memes. They all hated on him, right? And of course, they were all wrong. Daniel Jones came out his rookie season, proved everybody wrong. In fact, he proved people wrong from the preseason. From the get-go, from his first preseason game, where he went like five for five, like 70 some yards on that one drive, you know, nicely placed ball for the touchdown, all that. People were impressed. Heads started to be turned. Um, Giants fans started to come around. You could argue Giants fans came around before that uh, that preseason game, but this was really the first momentous turning point. And remember, he was a dude like booed outside of Giants Stadium. You know what I'm saying? He was booed at a Yankee game for no reason. The kid done nothing wrong. It's not his fault he was taken taken at sixth overall. He came in preseason, wild everybody. That's where he earned the nickname Danny Dimes. Wild everybody with his precision passing. That's what people took away from that game. The fact that when he places the ball, it's almost always right in the receiver's hands or right in a catchable range that it's really up to the receiver to take that ball down now. People were impressed by his ability to read and scan the field as quickly as he could. Definitely not something expected from a rookie quarterback, but then it seems that people forgot he was coached by Cuffcliffe at Duke. They like to say, hey man, he played at Duke. He didn't really have, he wasn't with a great football team, you know. He's, he wasn't with one of these big programs, and it just seems like people forget that some of the best quarterbacks don't really come from the biggest programs. Tom Brady is from Michigan, and while Michigan, you know, is a big football program. I'm talking about in the sense like they were, the way they were treating Daniel Jones is as though they wanted him to be from, uh, you know, in an Alabama, from an Oklahoma, from an Ohio State. And we know exactly why they wanted him to be from that Ohio State program. That's not the point right now. But Duke is still, you know, a division one team. Duke still faced teams like Clemson, you know, where Daniel Jones performed well against. Uh, and because he had as little talent as he, did, as he did at Duke, it helped him out in his rookie year, which I'm going to get to eventually. I know that you guys are probably saying, hey, man, why don't you cover the stats already? Listen, I'll get to that. Part of the reason DJ did as good as he did in his rookie year was because he dealt with an even worse offensive line at Duke, a very porous offensive line and a terrible uh, set of receivers at Duke. Uh, none of Daniel Jones' receivers that he threw to in his senior year were drafted. That tells you how bad they were. Um, you know, in general, his entire Duke team was terrible. It's why the dude performed so well. For you to win at Duke, where you had no offensive line, you had no weapons, where your number one target wasn't even drafted, where you're getting shot in the face like every five seconds by a defensive lineman or an edge rusher, where your receivers are dropping balls. By the way, I think Daniel Jones, out of all the quarterbacks that were drafted, had the most dropped balls in, you know, in that entire draft class. I think the guy that came closest, Jared Stidham, 
and maybe it's one of the two maybe both of them had you know somewhere around the same but Daniel Jones for sure was one of the quarterbacks that had the most drop balls at Duke. You go back and you look at his tape, he would place touchdown passes right in the receiver's hands and they, it, they just drop it. It would just fall through like their hands are just for decoration. But it doesn't matter because that all helped him when he got in the league. Regular season last year, here are his stats. Played in 13 games, started 12, threw for 3,027 yards with a 61.9% completion percentage 24 touchdowns 12 interceptions and of course the biggest knock on him was his 18 fumbles last year that's right 18 i'm sure giants fans probably thought it was a bit lower but not to worry of course not all 18 went to the other team i think it was like around 50 percent of those fumbles like nine or ten of them were recovered regardless it still was 18 fumbles right so the guy in his rookie season with a giants offense that was hampered by injuries and you know by other stuff like, like let's go down the receiving core Sterling Shepard with his concussion problem, Darius Slayton, people do forget he was injured at the beginning of the season, uh, Golden Tate missed our first four games, uh, before he came in, you know, the receiving court I was playing there with Eli where guys are like on their fourth, you know, the four string receivers, special team guys, not exactly the best weapons for a first year quarterback. You got Evan Ingram who couldn't stay healthy and even Saquon Barkley, the surprise injury of the entire bunch, it just seemed like every one of Jones's weapons was sort of gone out for a while. Like. He didn't get to play with the weapon outside with the full, you know, three starters that, that we know and love, Shepard, Ingram, Barkley, I think until like halfway through, maybe even later than that in the season, because by that point, you know, guys were hampered a little bit, but he was never even given the Giants team that he was supposed to be given because of injuries, added on to the fact that we had a coaching staff that really regressed from their rookie years as Giants you know and Pat Shermer and James Betcher of course the defense does play a part in this because the defense didn't do anybody any favors last year by giving up tons of points and making the offense come on the field uh more than usual it was kind of a a, a give and take relationship both ways the offense couldn't stay on the field long enough to give the defense rest and the defense couldn't stay on the field long enough to give the offense rest it was just a really bad cycle that happened last year and like I said they regressed these coaches because I, while Pat Shermer, I will admit, Daniel Jones had a great rookie year in my standards. He definitely outplayed what everybody, what, you know, the hate that everybody gave him. My opinion, should have won rookie of the year over uh, Kyler Murray, at least offensive rookie of the year. I Like, bro, you give Dwayne Haskins the stats that Daniel Jones had and Dwayne Haskins would have won rookie of the year. It's just that the media don't want to admit that they're wrong. That's a conversation for another day. But Pat Shermer, while he had a great impact on Daniel Jones, you know, as a quarterback coach type of guy, you know, just helping him develop in his first year in every other uh, situation and in every other breath, he was a terrible coach. The uh, offense certainly regressed, the performance of the offensive line regressed, which I've already spoke on, you know, I spoke on that in a different video, does partly have to do with Jones because he's a rookie, because he's quarterback presence is not that you know equivalent to Eli Manning who has 16 years of quarterback presence under his belt um and that definitely helped with the regression or I guess that have that definitely hampered the offensive line a little bit and caused with their regression and then the offense was just stale easy to figure out not at all prepared week in and week out and it made Jones look worse than I think he actually is which is think about that that's a statement he already had a great rookie year and he was under an offense that I believe hampered him Things change, and things have changed this offseason. Of course, completely new coaching staff, completely brand new, almost everything. Let's uh, let's start with the coaching staff. Joe Judge, a coach that will not be calling plays and actually have time to address the whole team. You know, every every single facet of the team, whether it's offense, defense, or special teams, and coach all of them. Not somebody you know like a Pat Shermer that has to split time between making game plans. Um. Uh, creating plays, calling plays, worrying about the offense mostly because he's also the offensive play caller and then doing all the other responsibilities of a head coach. Now there are head coaches in similar positions that have succeeded but speaking, we're speaking about Pat Shermer here because he was the previous one. Didn't work out. I like the approach Judge is taking, that CEO type of role, CEO mentality where he's overseeing everything and letting the coordinators do their jobs. Speaking of which, Extremely underrated hire by the Giants and Jason Garrett as their offensive coordinator. Jason Garrett, when a coordinator, not a head coach, 
when an offensive coordinator was one of the best in the league, people do forget, you know, in that 20, uh, 2007, I was about to say, so used to saying stuff like 2017 now. <laughs> in that 2007 season, where the historic Patriots, that 16-0 Patriots, number one offense in the league, who was right behind them? Jason Garrett and the Cowboys with Tony Romo, T.O. They were putting up numbers for days, a extremely you know high profile offense that runs a lot you know the vertical run and shoot game with the air coreal system relies a lot on the run game but also has a lot of vertical passes in there so a very uh, offense that's going to score a lot of points while controlling the clock something that this offensive line has you know kind of been built to do which i'll get into very shortly Be but jason garrett another good thing about him developing quarterbacks spoke about tony romo an undrafted free agent that without a doubt I performed his undrafted free agent label. This guy, you know, should he be taken in any draft now as a young Tony Romo would undoubtedly go in the first round. Dak Prescott, a guy taken in the fourth round, thought to be a backup. He's now one of the better quarterbacks of the league. Now, you guys know it's not a secret that I'm not a fan of Dak Prescott. I don't hate him. I just think he's a little bit overrated, but I do think he's a top 15 quarterback in the league. You can say top 10, I won't argue with that. Maybe he is top 10 because if I'll be completely honest with you again, I can't name 10 quarterbacks better than Dak Prescott right now. And of course, with the whole contract situation going on, my stance on that is that the Cowboys gave him a great offer with the 30 million a year or a little bit over 30 million. I think Dak is asking for a little too much. Another conversation for another day. If you guys want that, put it down below in the comments. But Dak, get it back to the topic here. Dak Prescott, a guy taken in the fourth round to be a backup. Now one of the better starters in the league, top 10 quarterback, developed by Jason Garrett. Speaking of quarterback development, Jerry Shaplinski, our new quarterback's coach from Miami and the Patriots. Other quarterbacks he developed, Jab Jacoby Brissett, and oh, the guy that was just in the Super Bowl, Jimmy Garoppolo. Admittedly, he underperformed in the Super Bowl, but another quarterback that's a top 10, top 15 quarterback in the league. And of course, Jerry Shaplinski had a couple years there where he was uh, you know, he had experience with Tom Brady. They definitely learned from each other uh, as a coach and player relationship. Somebody else along with Jason Garrett that I think is going to extremely help Daniel Jones improve. I don't expect to see that many fumbles from him next year because of this coaching staff, because of the way they're going to coach him up, because of what they're going to teach him. I think he's going to have a way better pocket presence, a better ball security. I think we're not going to see fumbles and now get finally getting to the offensive line. Another reason why when they, when your guy sacked 38 times and pressured countless times, of course, he's there's going to be a couple fumbles in there to pair with his inexperience. Offensive line, in my opinion, fixed up. Uh, first pick uh, in the first round. Well, not in the first round, but, uh, you know, our first pick. Andrew Thomas, best left tackle in the draft. You guys, if you've been following me, know me. He was my favorite left tackle in the draft because he's the one with the most experience and also the most well-rounded uh, offensive tackle prospect that has experience at both the right and left side, but is definitely built for that left blind side and is also have not given up a sack in this past year. The safest offensive line prospect, definitely the guy with the highest floor, in my opinion. Ceilings, you could argue all day, every day. The, the top four guys from that class, you could argue ceilings, but the highest floor was Andrew Thomas, and that's gonna help because he's gonna come in and he's gonna have an easier transition to the NFL than the other three guys, in my opinion. Great in pass blocking, great in run blocking. Some people say his pass blocking is better than his run blocking because of the fact that he didn't give up a sack, because of how safe he was for a you know a stationary quarterback in Jake Fromm. In my opinion, his run blocking is better than his pass blocking. So that just tells you the guy is great everywhere. Cause I think he's gonna be great for Saquon Barkley. Saquon running to the left side now of that offensive line with Andrew Thomas and Will Hernandez. You could you could bet on this, bro. Book it, Saquon's getting at least 1,500 rushing yards next year, barring any injuries. And you already know that's gonna help out in the passing game, which of course I'll get to. But you know, Andrew Thomas on the left side, Matt Peart preparing to be our future right tackle. Of course, Nate Solder, I think, is gonna move over to the right side where he should have an easier time than he did at left tackle. And we got a guard out of Oregon and Shane Lemieux, an absolute mauler. He's really very much like Will Hernandez in both the way he plays and his attitude on the field that can play center and will probably be running and gunning for that center position on the offensive line. In my opinion, the offensive line much improved from last year. Is it finished? That remains to be seen, but it's better than last year and that's automatically gonna help out Jones because he's gonna have better protection and the run game, along with the type of system ran by Jason Garrett, is gonna allow him to get uh, you know passes deeper down the field, allow defenses to bite on the run more, does 
giving him more time in the pocket. It's just going to help him out all around. And of course, that's all the things surrounding him. But Daniel Jones as a player, as a person, I think is going to progress regardless if any of that happened. He's a very smart kid. Very intelligent, you know, both outside the field and in the field, you know, football IQ along with regular intelligence. I expect him no matter what, you know, let's say none of these things happen. I expected him to still th take a leap forward in his second year. Let's go off of um, quarterbacks that their second year that did great things. Lamar Jackson, the most recent one, the MVP. He had a fumbling problem his rookie year too, albeit not as bad as Daniel Jones, but he came back and he won the MVP. Patrick Mahomes, of course, sat his rookie year. Most of his rookie year came in and started his sophomore year, won the MVP. Uh, Carson Wentz, before he went down in 2017, was on track for the MVP. You could go on and on, you know, in, in the recent years of quarterbacks taking a step forward in their sophomore year. Without a doubt, I believe Daniel Jones is going to do that. It's just the way that they're built now. And I, that feels weird to say, this generation of quarterbacks. But it is it is the way they're built. It is the way that they've been, you know, trained and groomed. And basically the way that they've came out of college is that they take a good step in their second year. And Jones being a smart guy, a guy that works hard, uh, I think he's going to take a step regardless. So you combine all of that. And with his base being 3,000 yards, 24 touchdowns, uh, 12 interceptions and of course I will mention the 18 fumbles let him improve let his offensive line improve let his weapons improve should they stay healthy I'm saying why not why can't he go for a 4,000 yard 30 touchdown 12 interceptions I'm keeping it the same number because once again he's improving it's not like he's decreasing um and then even less fumbles like that's a breakout year that's a great year he could have more who knows he was on pace to break the rookie touchdown record He's going to have a great year next year. That's where things are building. Um, and I, I think he's going to be a top 10 quarterback statistics wise. And I think he's going to be a top 10 quarterback in all the, the things that you can't measure, all the intangibles. Daniel Jones is going to be a top 10 quarterback next year, breakout year, whatever you want to call it. He's going to be that guy. Be excited, Giants fans. Let me know what you think. I'm out. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. Put your comments down below. Make sure you smash that like button, subscribe, and turn on post notifications. Until next time, I'm out. Yer.